Welcome to Venable's post-election webinar on healthcare. It's the sixth installment of our post-election webinar series. If you've missed our earlier sessions on topics including the corporate, consumer protection, and government contract outlook, please see our website for links to those presentations. The week after Thanksgiving, please tune in to hear about real estate, nonprofit, infrastructure, transportation, and international trade outlooks. The details on how to join those, uh, those parts of our webinar series is found on our website. Today, though, we'll focus on healthcare, a critical topic as we sit here today in a worsening COVID pandemic, although the prospect of a safe and effective vaccine is on the horizon. I'm Tora Johnson and a partner in our healthcare group. I'm joined here today with my legislative colleagues, Congressman Stupak, Mike Bloomquist, Nick Choate, and Sarah Donovan, and my partner, Juliana Reno, who focuses on health and welfare benefits for employers. With that, let's dive right in. We've got a lot to cover, so we'll address questions at the end. But feel free to submit them through the chat feature while fresh in your mind and in real time as we move through the presentation. With that, I'll hand over to Nick and Sarah. Thank you. Um, so here at the top, we'll spend a little time just recapping the election. Um, the map you see here uh, as of this morning, uh, unless they have certified Georgia since I have been sitting at the computer, uh, President-elect Biden has secured 290 electoral votes um, we do expect Georgia to certify their results for Biden today, um, which will eventually put him at 306 electoral votes. Uh, there are a handful of legal challenges from President Trump's team uh, still hanging out there, particularly in Pennsylvania. Uh, but um, conventional wisdom is those are unlikely to be successful. Sarah, do you want to talk about the Senate? Thanks, Nick. Yep, here we're looking at a map of the um, Senate races that we um, we had elections for just earlier this month. And as you can see from the bar at the bottom, we are currently sitting at um, with 50 Republicans returning to the Senate and 48 Democrats. This leaves two seats outstanding, and that's due to neither uh, neither of the Georgia seats that were um, that we had elections for, um, ha were able to reach the 50% threshold. So that means that they go to a runoff, and that runoff will occur on January 5th. Republicans, if they get even one of those two seats, will retain the Senate majority outright. However, if Democrats were to win both, then they would be at a 50-50 um, balance with Republicans, and that would mean that uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will be the tie-breaking vote. Turn it back to you. Oh, and actually, I'd like to turn it to Congressman Bart Stupak um, to talk to us a little bit about the results of the House elections. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, everyone, my colleagues on this call. The U.S. House of Representatives, needless to say for Democrats, was a very disappointing election. They actually lost seven seats thus far. Uh, they were expected to pick up, actually pick up five to 15 seats but they lost seven. Republicans have picked up eight so far. So right now, if you count today, the map would look like this, or I should say the totals would look like this. For Democrats, 222 seats. Republicans, 205. Of course, you need 218 to pass anything in the House of Representatives. So there's four seats over the majority that the Democrats hold, and there are eight remaining races that are still too close to call even with like 98, 99% of the ballots in. There's some really, really tight races, which I'm sure we will hear more about and will probably split uh, between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, the interesting note, um, even though we have eight seats remaining to be determined, the House leadership had their elections yesterday for leadership, and everybody was basically back, Speaker Pelosi, Speaker, Majority Leader Hoyer still the floor leader, and the whip is uh, my friend Jim Clyburn. But there was an interesting uh, appointment, or I should say election. Catherine Clark was, was elected as 
assistant speaker. Never been in that position before in the, with the Democratic Party, maybe with Republicans years ago. But it puts her second in line in the speakership, uh, basically even before the majority floor leader. So Catherine Clark from Massachusetts received that position. Uh, so, so that's it from the House. Disappointing for the Democrats. Uh, Republicans gain at least eight seats. They'll probably be more like 10 or 12 by the time it's all done. And it's going to be a very slim Democratic majority in the House. And with that, I think I'll turn it back to Nick for our next slide. Great. Thank you. Um, so where does that put us? Um, we've still got roughly 60 days until inauguration. Um, Congress is currently in its lame duck session. Um, presidential election results, states have started to certify, as I mentioned, I think Georgia has a deadline of today to certify. We expect Michigan and Pennsylvania to certify on Monday, um, and those will just keep rolling in. Uh, Sarah mentioned we've got the Georgia Senate runoffs in January to decide control of the Senate. Um, but in the meantime, government funding runs out uh, after December 11th. So one way or another, Congress and the president need to find a way to either continue that funding for a relatively short amount of time through a continuing resolution or pass an omnibus spending bill to fully fund the government through next September, uh, the end of the fiscal year. There is still uh, chatter and hope in some corners that a COVID-19 relief bill uh, could be wrapped up in you know, the coming weeks, uh, possibly combined with the CR. Uh, it is looking more likely that COVID relief slips into the new year um, and perhaps the new administration, but um, talks are ongoing. And the biggest variable in all of this is what, if anything, the president will be willing to sign between now and when he leaves office. Um, no bill has hit his desk post-election, so it is a, safe to say very much a wild card uh, what will happen there. Congressman Stupak talked Sarah, a little bit about the, oh, sorry, Nick. Um, Congressman Stupak talked a little bit about the results of the House leadership elections already. So we have um, Speaker Pelosi uh, returning at the top, and we expect um, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell to lead the Republicans in the Senate next time as well. By the way, this slide obviously assumes that Republicans maintain control of the Senate in the 117th Congress, and um, that's you know, that's, a, that's an estimate, that's a that's guess on our part, um, but we'll, for the purposes of the slide, we'll, we'll proceed. On the House side with the committee chairs, um, you know, there's, this list looks largely the same, um, with the exception of House Appropriations Committee. Chairwoman Nita Lowy from New York is retiring, and there's currently a race um, on who will become the next chairperson of the House Appropriations Committee. When it comes to House Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, and House Financial Services Committee, we expect all those um, leaders to return, Richie Neal, Frank Pallone, and Maxine Waters. On the Senate side, Appropriations and the Senate Commerce Committee, they will return their top Republicans in Richard Shelby and Roger Wicker. However, because Senator um, Grassley, who currently chairs the Finance Committee, is term limited due to internal party rules, um, we have, he's going to move over to Senate Judiciary and take the gavel from Lindsey Graham. That means that Senator Crapo will move over from Senate Banking and chair Senate Finance, should Republicans maintain control. And um, Senator Pat Toomey will take over Senate Banking in um, Chairman Crapo's absence. We're going to talk a little bit more about the committees that impact healthcare more um, directly a little bit later in the presentation. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, so looking beyond the lame duck session and uh, the new Congress, uh, with the incoming administration, just kind of looking at a quick snapshot of the first 100 days here. Um, President-elect Biden has uh, already outlined that COVID, the economy, racial equity and climate change will be um, the kind of four buckets of first 100 day priorities. Um, 
on COVID specifically, again, this could happen in the lame duck session, uh, but more likely slips into next year, uh, another COVID response bill. I think um, you know, one relatively new element of that, given uh, announcements on uh, vaccine being within reach, is possible money to states for vaccine distribution. Um, immigration is another place we expect immediate action from a uh, Biden administration, largely on the regulatory side um, and through executive orders on doing much of what uh, Trump has done on immigration policy. Uh, I mentioned climate environment. Biden has made clear he intends to make this an early priority across government, um, things like reentering the Paris Agreement. Um, legislative push is still in the cards, uh, if Republicans hold the Senate, that probably becomes a, uh, a heavier lift in Congress, but I, we expect to see efforts there. Um, and then Voting Rights Advancement, uh, Voting Rights Act reauthorization um, is certainly something that uh, Democrats in the House and the Biden administration will push for, um, although it likely faces a, a, an uphill battle in the Senate. Um, another thing just to quickly touch on beyond one of the things that often forces um, congressional action is hard, hard deadlines when things expire. There are a few of those uh, coming up in the next year. Um, the Higher Education Act is always out there. It expired in 2014. Um, we expect to see activity there. Uh, but more pressingly, the debt limit uh, expired. The, Congress suspended the debt limit uh, through July 2021. So sometime between now and then, they have to either raise the debt limit or further suspend it. Um, surface transportation programs, including the Highway Trust Fund, expire at the end of September, um, <clears throat> which provides uh, an opening for at least reauthorization of those programs and perhaps a vehicle for a broader infrastructure package. Uh, National flood insurance program also expires at the same time. And of course, uh, healthcare is always in the mix. Um, in any given year, numerous provisions uh, expire. I'll talk a little bit about government spending. Generally speaking, um, we see increased government spending with Democratic administrations. We expect that pie to grow. So where could we see increased spending as it more directly impacts healthcare? We could see it um, in a stimulus and or COVID-19 response bill. We could see it in grant programs. We could see it in new programs and spending. This is something that Re Republican administrations have been, and Republican members of Congress, frankly, have been loath to have new spending, new programs. So we could see some, some new things pop up with a Biden administration and of course, appropriations. Democrats generally favor public institutions rather than private. I mean, I hate to talk in such broad brushes, but this is, this is true, and you know, especially as it relates to healthcare and education and things like that. And fiscal year 2020, 2022 rather, interestingly, will be the first in a decade where Congress isn't beholden to the Budget Control Act of 2011, which imposed budget caps. And now those are caps on discretionary spending um, as it relates to defense and non-defense, both. There's actually been renewed chatter recently about coming back to some sort of congressionally directed spending, we typically call these earmarks. Um, and in fact, the House Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress recommended this very thing in September as part of its report. Great, thank you, Sarah. So let's talk about regulations. Generally speaking, there are more regulations under a democratic administration. We do, though, anticipate that part of the Biden administration's day one work will be undoing some of Trump's regulatory changes, particularly the ones that have unwound parts of the Affordable Care Act. Under that category, we, sus we suspect that um, we may see the Biden administration revisit short-term health plans. These are plans that typically have lower premiums 
but provide far less comprehensive coverage and don't have all the ACA protections for people, such as protections for pre-existing condition exclusions, preventive care, um, which would now cover COVID testing and um, a COVID vaccine. Under the Obama administration, an individual could remain covered under a short-term health plan for only three months. It was really meant just to be a bridge plan. And under the Trump administration, it was expanded um, to a year. So I suspect we'll see some shortening of that. Also, open enrollment on the exchanges. Uh, the Trump administration shortened the open enrollment periods on the federal exchanges to six weeks, half of what it was under the Obama administration. So I do think we'll see uh, them lengthen out again. Also, uh, under the Obama administration, regulations were issued under Section 1557, which provided for non-discrimination in health care, including non-discrimination provisions to protect the LGBTQ population. And I suspect that we will see some work in this area as well. The Biden administration has stated that it will, quote, defend the rights of all people, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, to have access to quality, affordable health care, free from discrimination. But then there are also a set of regulations that um, I suspect will see stay in place, such as the regulation shifting away from fee-for-service to value-based care. Also, the increased access to telehealth, and then uh, newly finalized health plan price transparency, and then ho hospital price transparency regulations. So arming individuals with, uh, with the cost of care so they can be better consumers of health care and also the various sets of regulations dealing with patient access to their health rec records, um, the interoperability of, of the medical system. Then we expect to hear today uh, news from the Trump administration on the lowering of drug pricing. We expect it to be in the form of an interim final rule, thereby bypassing the gathering of public feedback and the time that that takes. We think that it will be a most favored nations rule linking government payment for medicines to lower prices paid abroad and potentially include the elimination of rebates that drug makers pay to PBMs. So stay tuned for that. I'm not sure if any of my colleagues want to weigh in with any color on, on what we're expecting to see today. Uh, this is Mike Sorry, Blomquist. I, oh. uh, Go ahead, Mike. Uh, uh, I mean, I think it's it's fascinating that the Trump administration is trying to rush out these two drug pricing rules right at the end here. Kind of, I'm sure that drug pricing would be something that the Biden administration would want to lean into and and want to move um, fairly aggressively on. But um, it's going to be interesting if they if they defend the rules um to the inevitable lawsuits that come in how hard do they defend them do they do they do they repeal them as interim rules and then let prices go back up for people um uh, or for the government i mean it's just that it raises a really interesting uh set of questions at the at the, at the 11th hour and um, one note on telehealth i think that's been one of the the big uh successes of of you know small silver linings of this of this of this covid era um but i i know there's a lot of concern bipartisan concern on the hill that the expansive waivers that were put in place to promote telemedicine um only last for the duration of the national health emergency and so um i think there is definitely interest which will, I'm sure, be contested, but interest in providing HHS with the authorities to allow uh, telemedicine, and particularly cross-state telemedicine, to uh, uh, persist uh, after the emergency. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, the, the other rules that we are expecting to see today are um, rules that will overhaul fraud, waste, and 
and abuse rules. So um, it should be a exciting Friday afternoon um, and lots of good reading for the holiday week next week. Next slide, if you wouldn't mind. Let's talk about COVID-19 policies. So um, I'm sure you've all heard that Biden has rolled out his COVID-19 advisory board tasked with developing an action plan. Uh, we expect this to be much more focused on a national approach to testing, tracking, and controlling the virus, uh, with a lot of focus on more testing, particularly cheap and rapid testing. And then uh, there is the matter of pushing out the vaccines and unresolved logistical challenges and actually very little federal guidance at the moment of how to prioritize the distribution of the vaccination. So expect that we will hear much more about that in the coming weeks. And I do think it's important to note that um, under, under Trump and uh, expect it to continue into the next administration, we do have free testing, uh, both under employer group health plans and under Medicare for COVID testing. And vaccinations are preventive care and also at no cost to individuals covered by their employer group health plans and part of Medicare under Medicare Part B. Um, and it's interesting it's under Part B and not Part D because more people have the traditional Part B than they do uh, Part D. And then um, other COVID-related policies, Mike just spoke to telehealth. We do think that that is here to stay, working on improving reimbursement for telehealth, more flexibility and licensure issues. Um, also expect that perhaps we'll see new special enrollment periods on the exchanges for COVID-related illnesses. And um, we'll see how all that develops. I also think not necessarily COVID specific, but more policy rather than regulations that we were just talking about. Under the Trump administration, states are allowed to require certain Medicaid recipients to work in order to receive benefits. I think it's about eight states that received approval, seven have pending requests. Others, there are court cases that are tied up in the court. Um, we'll see whether the Biden administration might seek to unwind the ability of states to impose work requirements for Medicaid. And um, although nothing has happened yet, maybe there is, there is focus and bipartisan focus on elimination of surprise billing so that patients are not receiving bills from out-of-network providers that they didn't choose. So more to see on, on the healthcare policies, but that's what we're thinking. And with that, is it back to you, Nick? I think we're coming over to um, me. I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Bart, to you. Yeah, right. Thanks, Nick. On key health players, the legislation for health care, of course, will start in the House because it's the Democrats control the House. Um, the House Ways and Means Committee will be on the revenue side of any health care plan. And President-elect Biden has said he's going to start with a public option plan. Remember the public option plan, the nonprofit public health care plan um, was in the House in 2009, actually passed in the House in 2009, went to the Senate, and the Senate didn't like, and that's how we ended up with these exchanges. But anyways, the House has seen this legislation before. So these House players like Richie Neal, uh, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, they'll be dealing with the revenue side of any health care plan. And the ranking Republican member is Kevin Brady of Texas, both seasoned uh, uh, legislators, and I expect a good piece of legislation from House Ways and Means on revenue raising. Education and labor will have a small piece of uh, any bill that comes through on health care, whether it's a public option or Medicare for all, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it's a small piece. But the real policy making and where the rubber meets the road, if you will, is on the Energy and Commerce Committee. And Chairman Frank Pallone, New Jersey, has been there and went through the last one. But Anna issue is uh, of California is the health subcommittee, and and I think also uh, Dr. Raul Ruiz, 
who's on the Energy and Commerce Committee, doctor out of California, Democrat, will have a lot of input on it, uh, on any kind of legislative plan. Top Republicans, um, you know, that's it's a little race going on there between uh, Congressman Michael Burgess, who's actually a doctor out of Texas, Bob Latta, Ohio, and Kathy McMorris Rogers. I don't know if Mike Bloomquist, you want to weigh in on who might win that one, but uh, that's an interesting race. And what other, don't forget the speaker. She played a key role in passing the Affordable Care Act. She'll be there again. And her main individual on health care is Wendell Primus. So th- those are the key players on health care. Mike, I don't know if you want to weigh in on the next top Republican on Energy and Commerce Committee. Yeah, thanks, Bart. I mean, they're, uh, you know, we're lucky it's three good candidates. They all come from a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, Dr. Burgess, obviously, uh, in the weeds on health care um, and uh, comes from an oversight uh, background. Um, Mrs. Rogers came, was in leadership for a long time, was the number three or number four, depending on if you're in the majority or the minority, and came back to the committee as a subcommittee um, uh Staff director and ranking member, and uh, and and Bob Lott is the currently the telecom subcommittee ranking member and a 20 plus year uh, veteran. Um, all, all three of them are working hard. I would have to say that uh, Mrs. Rogers and Dr. Burgess are the favorites um, due to their seniority and just uh, how how tenaciously they've pursued the the post. But um, there was an article in the paper this morning though saying that that. Uh, Bob Lotta was 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 right there and gonna gonna see it through to the end. So he's still he's still fighting. So it'll be really interesting to see what the Republican steering committee does and and uh, and and who wins the race. Well, either way, with uh, those three quality uh, members running for the top seat, ranking member on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, Dr. Mike Burgess certainly will have a lot of say in how the Republicans approach the health care plan put forth by the. By the Democrats, and I also have to say that I enjoyed my time when I was chairman of oversight investigations, and, and Mike was the ranking uh, Republican, and, and we got along well and did some good work together. So I think we're in the next. Yeah, he's a hard. Go ahead. I can say he's a hardworking guy. That's for sure. He is. He is. I think Nick, were you going to take the Senate key players since your last staff assignments were in the Senate, Nick? <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm going to start this one off and then I'm going to kick it to Sarah. Thanks. Um, so we touched on this, uh, I believe, at the top briefly. Um, mo- I shouldn't say most. A lot of health care policy in the Senate uh, goes through the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, they have jurisdiction over Medicare and Medicaid. Um, regardless of what happens with the Senate majority due to the runoffs in Georgia, um, we will see a leadership change on the Republican side of the aisle. Uh, Chairman, current Chairman Chuck Grassley of Iowa is term limited in that role. Um, so Senator Mike Crapo from Idaho is the next in line to become the top Republican on the committee. Again, whether that is in the chairmanship slot if Republicans are in the majority or the ranking member slot if they are in the minority. And Senator Ron Wyden from Oregon, Democrat from Oregon, will remain the top Democrat on the committee in either scenario. Uh, Sarah, do you want to speak a little bit about the health committee? Sure. So the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, otherwise known as the HELP Committee, its chair, its chairman, um, Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, is retiring. So that top slot is open. Senator Richard Burr from North Carolina, he's next in line to be top Republican. But he's currently under investigation for some trades, um, some stock trades. Um, and we haven't really heard when that investigation will wrap up. We thought it might be right after the election, but we're getting kind of close to the end of the month and we haven't seen it yet. But regardless of that fact, he still considered the top contender to take over the health committee from Senator Alexander. Um, in the instance that he is not the next uh, chairperson or ranking member of the health committee, the next three senators in line are Senator Paul from Kentucky, Senator Collins, who just won her re-election in Maine, and Dr. Cassidy in Louisiana. In either scenario, no matter who becomes a top Republican, we expect Senator Patty Murray from Washington to remain the top Democrat on the health committee. And with that, she brings an enormous amount of experience 
um, with help, and she also happens to be the ranking member on the um, on the Health um, Appropriations Subcommittee as well. That's the Labor HHS Subcommittee on Appropriations. So um, she'll have a great partner in any of these senators, but um, I think that she's a great person to have in the top slot, um, remaining in the top slot of the Democratic side. Well, the, let me jump in on the Thanks, vice president's health agenda. Um, Nick, were you coming in on this one, or do you want me to take it? No, I was. I was actually just kicking it over to you. Thanks. Okay, thanks. It's hard to do it. We're all on phones here. Um, but on the Democratic side, I, I, I can see as this president-elect Biden has said he's going to expand and strengthen the Affordable Care Act via legislation and using administrative steps. Uh, he's talked about the nonprofit public op option plan, which I mentioned earlier was the original House plan in 2009. Uh, drug pricing, even though the President Trump is going to put out some uh, regulations today, I agree with Mike Bloomquist, he'll probably be tied up in court and probably never take effect. But uh, he will try to, President uh, Biden administration, will try to lower the prices uh, with imports as long as they're safe and effective, but also uh, some, some price controls and finally give the Secretary of HHS the authority to negotiate lower drug prices, much like the uh, VA does in lower drug prices for, for veterans. And you could see almost probably 30 to 40 percent decrease in prices if HHS is allowed to negotiate on the best interests of the, of the American people. And of course, as we're going through, it's, I know it's healthcare focused, but surprise billing, uh, if there's bipartisan support, I'm sure we'll do something like that. PADUFA, that's a prescription drug utilization fee act. Uh, that has to be reauthorized as, as every year. And look for new, new legislation on cosmetics, the ingredients, how they're used, testing, uh, adverse conditions. Uh, that's been a project that um, Chairman Pallone has looked at for the last couple of years, and I would expect to see a draft early in the 2021 on cosmetic regulation of cosmetics. Um, going to the next slide, if we look at the non-profit public option health plan, it's interesting to note, like I said, in 2009, the House passed the public option plan. There's approximately uh, 90 to 96 Democratic members who were there back in 2009 when I was there and we voted for the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so, so they have some familiarity with the public option plan. And a lot, of course, will depend on what happens with the Supreme Court. Democrats always felt that Okay, even if the Supreme Court throws out the Affordable Care Act in, in the spring of 2021, we'll have the House and Senate and the presidency, and we'll just quickly pass another piece of legislation. <laughs> well, uh, funny things happen on, on the way to the market. Uh, doesn't look like the Democrats are going to take over the Senate, so they are going to have to negotiate with their Republican friends, and we'll have to uh, see what happens with the Supreme Court. Uh, my Guessed it, guesstimation, guess if you will, because I don't think the Supreme Court throws out the whole law. So it'll be very interesting how they write it, how they narrowly define it, or will they broadly say, no, the Affordable Care Act must fall because the individual mandate is no longer there. There's really about three part tests they have to go through, and I'm not too sure they're going to make all three, so I'm not too sure they totally get rid of the Affordable Care Act. But look at um, Vice President Biden said throughout the campaign that he's going to use a public option. And when you take a look at that public option and how he's defined it underneath his plan, it's really a glide, glide path to Medicare for all, or basically a single-payer system that Bernie Sanders and others had advocated for. That glide path is probably four to five, maybe even eight years. But I, I just see us going almost to a single-payer system if the public option, as envisioned by President-elect Trump, I'm, I'm sorry, President-elect Biden, um, becomes a reality. When we say public option health plan, it, it really is a government-sponsored nonprofit health plan, similar to Medicare. It's, it is funded by premiums, premiums made by the American people. It must, must meet all the regulations. A public option plan must meet all regulations that private insurance companies do, including solvency, liquidity, uh, patient bill of rights, the regulations under the Affordable Care Act, if it's still standing, pre-existing injuries got to cover. 
pre-existing disease. So it's, it's, it's just going to be like any other insurance plan. The, pro, the issue is it's funded by American people. And it, as long as it remains solvent, it will be just that, an option. You're not going to be required to go underneath the public option. There will be an option to the insurance policies that are being offered right now. Um, and, again, it will only exist as long as Americans buy into it and the premiums are enough to keep the public option solvent. Um, one way you do it with a public option plan that was in the 2009 bill, and I think you'll see it again because it's popular with the Democrats, is take away the health insurance industry's antitrust exemption. Um, immediately create a high-risk pool uh, so there's a carryover period of time. We did that in uh, 2009, and it was very, very successful. And that high-risk pool is for people who are uninsured because of pre-existing conditions, diseases, and injuries. Uh, allow young people to remain on their insurance, parents' insurance policy. You can see that with just about any uh, plan that would come out of the, the house because it's so popular. Um, I do believe, in, and Democrats have always said, if we're going to have a successful plan, everyone must be included. Therefore, I see the individual mandate coming back and some penalty attached to it. Uh, like right now, there's a mandate, but there's zero penalty. Uh, before we close the prescription drug loophole, someone mentioned uh, Medicare Part D. That's where that falls. That was done in the Affordable Care Act, but as less and less the Affordable Care Act has been falling on the exchanges, uh, that donut hole is starting to rear its head again. Um, anyways, um, one other thing that the Biden president elect Biden said during the campaign, which was not in any of the plans, was people who are not who are in the United States non citizens, whatever you want to call them, immigrants, illegal immigrants, whatever you want to call them, they would be covered underneath a Biden plan. That is a big departure from 2009. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, just quickly, required a secretary of HHS to negotiate lower drug prices, like they do with the VA right now, which lowers the price for veterans by 30 to 40 percent of what you see on the market. And, and how does the federal government do that? If federal government negotiate lower drug cost prices, lower prices for prescription drugs, other companies, others will follow suit. The largest consumer of prescription drugs in the world is the United States government. By the time you get with their Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, uh, Federal Employees Health Benefit Package, we have great negotiating power. So why don't we negotiate that power on behalf and use that, use that power on behalf of the American people? So look for a drug price plan underneath a public option plan, which would actually lower the cost of drugs. Um, prohibit employers from reducing pay to cover the cost of health care. You only want to limit, eliminate the lifetime caps on benefits, and limit the yearly out-of-pocket uh, expenses. The next slide we have um, is about employee mandates in health care. And I think, Thora or Julia, you guys are going to pick up on this a little bit, how it impacts, um, how it impacts employers more than, well, I shouldn't say more than anybody else, but it, it really does impact employers because most people receive their insurance through their employer. So let me throw it back to Thora, and uh, you can pick up on there, and I'll chime in where necessary. Thanks, Bart. This is Juliana, actually. <clears throat> and this is the, the part of the public option plan that is the same as the Affordable Care Act, essentially, which is that employers either have to provide a certain kind of insurance to their full-time employees or they have to pay a penalty. And there's various exceptions, um, but this is, has really, in our experience, has really driven really impacted employers quite a bit and has driven them to offer coverage, not always cheap coverage, but at least coverage to, um, to more of their employees. So I think they're going to be uh, very interested in this section and, and how it all works. Obviously, the more like the Affordable Care Act it is, the more familiar and easy the transition, although they don't exactly love the Affordable Care Act. Um, the, this, go ahead. Bart, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, the public option, as, as we said, would be an employer mandate. Uh, that's really where it, where it comes down. 
when you talk about the public option, as I said earlier, where do most people get their health insurance? Through their employer. So to provide the public option plan, as we did in 2009, it's really a requirement upon the employer. The employer just says, look, I got less than 10 employees. I don't want to pay it. You don't have to. You pay a premium, which goes into the public option insurance plan. But if you are providing it, back in 2009, we had some parameters like employer contribution to employee, um, you know, 72% of the wages were sort of like exempt out of it. And, and family coverage, um, you had to have good policies that would cover about 65% of it. And, but the employer was always capped. Let's say like if you're an employer and you have 20 employees, um, your cost could not exceed more than back in 2009 was 12%, not sure would be now. So it, it, it's, there's small business exceptions, uh, there's an employer waiver for undue hardship, uh, and employer employees, okay, employer offer it, but employee can say no, my wife is working as an attorney with the Venable Law Firm and she has great insurance, I don't need it. So therefore, Mr. Employer, you don't have to provide it for me, you can opt out and there's no penalty for that. But you know, the hard part is we've talked a little bit tonight, or I should say today, this morning, is the, how are you gonna pass it? With the Senate with 51, because I, I expect they'll split the Georgia Senate race, so it's 51-49. You know, are the Democrats gonna go back and use the budget reconciliation where you only need 51 votes? Are Democrats gonna try to force it there? Or is Joe Biden gonna actually, in, Kamala Harris is going to have to sit down with Republican senators, and there's a number of them who I think would help them out and maybe pass something, again, use a budget reconciliation, getting 51 votes. Would you have a Collins, a Murkowski, uh, maybe one or two others, maybe a Pat Toomey out of Pennsylvania, all helping you out? So reconciliation, as a general rule, it says, okay, here's the bills that the nation has. Here's our revenues. Let, let's reconcile the difference. Let's, you know, reconcile our books. Once a year they do that. And it's been used 21 times since 1980 and last in uh, 2017 by the Republicans. So it, it, it's going to be a tough slog, um, whether it's a public option plan, nonprofit public option health insurance plan. Uh, but I do think Joe Biden's going to make a serious, serious run at providing health care for all Americans, which means about 34 35 million Americans should be covered. If you take the Affordable Care Act and probably about another 10 million that are not covered, then you throw in uh, people who are not citizens, you're probably looking at 35, 45 million Americans being covered under a policy which would start off as a public option and then glide into almost a single payer system. So Thora, let me throw it back to you now. Thank you, Bart. The, um, I think then we can go forward a couple more slides. You want to go to California? And there we go. And I think go so right to right to Juliana. Thank you. Actually, Nick, did you have anything else to say about about reconciliation? Um, I'll go back here just for a second. I'll briefly touch on this. Um, I I think this will only become important if Democrats win both Georgia Senate seats and Democrats control Congress. Um, but budget reconciliation would be a potential vehicle to pass something healthcare related um, without needing to get 60 votes in the Senate. Um, it, it was used for good chunks of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it was used for the Republican tax bill, but it is a fairly uh, partisan uh, <coughs> maneuver at this point. And as long as Democrats control the House and Republicans control the Senate, it's hard to see this tool being used. Um, it is somewhat limited in nature. So even within the healthcare space, um, it, it is limited in what it can do. Uh, provisions must be fiscal in nature, meaning revenue spending or debt limit. Um, with healthcare, particularly in Medicare and Medicaid, there is a lot that's possible there. But changing policies is, generally speaking, off the table. Um, for example, Republicans used reconciliation um, to try to repeal 
significant chunks of the ACA, but even with the individual mandate, uh, they couldn't eliminate the mandate. They could only eliminate the tax penalty for noncompliance, which is probably a good segue into the next slide, Juliana. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about California versus Texas, which is the Supreme Court case, uh, the current challenge to the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> and this really goes back, if, if you recall, to 2013 when um, there was a much more existential or much more substantive challenge to the Affordable Care Act, basically saying, was the individual mandate constitutional? John Roberts, to everyone's surprise, um, decided that it was constitutional as an exercise of the taxing power and that it was so intimately entwined with the rest of the law that um, there was no severability, so the whole law would stand. In 2017, as Nick just said, as part of the budget reconciliation process, Congress reduced the tax to zero, and that kicked off this current challenge. Um, there are three issues. I've got them here in sort of logical order, but but let me talk about the constitutional one first because it has to do with this budget reconciliation thing, which is if you move the tax to zero, you have a, you have language in the in the Affordable Care Act that says an individual must purchase insurance, but there's no penalty now. There's no penalty for failing to purchase insurance. So the question is, is that is that still justifiable? And that turns on, is it a command? So are people actually being told that they must buy insurance if there's no penalty for failing to buy insurance? Or is it merely quote unquote precatory language? Like, you know, y'all should buy insurance because we don't have any penalty for it. Um, if it's precatory language, it doesn't need to be justified because it's not a command. If it's a command, then it does need to be justified. And the fact that there is zero penalty is a problem. So that's the constitutional issue. The standing issue is logically prior to that. Um, and it's about if, if you are being told to purchase insurance, but there's no penalty for failing to, how have you been harmed? And <clears throat> there was a lot of trouble on that one. I think the individual defendants um, have have hard time showing standing. The states have a little bit of an easier time showing standing because what they say is, look, some people are going to take this command seriously. They're going to enroll in Medicaid in order to meet the individual mandate, and we have to pay for Medicaid. So we have been harmed, which is an interesting argument. Okay, and then the big one, I think, uh, and Bart, Congressman Stupak mentioned this earlier, is the severability issue, which is, okay, let's just say that people have standing and let's just say that it's unconstitutional, what's the remedy? Is the remedy to pull down the whole law? Is the remedy to pull down only the individual mandate or is the remedy to pull down the individual mandate and the few provisions that are clearly related to it? Um, this took up quite a bit of the court's oral argument um, and a couple of the justices um, specifically um, Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh both basically said, yeah, I think um, that it's probably separable. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, I, I don't really know how it's going to go on the standing issue. I think it, it would be easier for everybody to kick it on standing, but the liberal justices traditionally um, want to have broad standing rules, not narrow standing rules. Um, so I'm not so sure that they would be willing to go along with the majority, with the conservatives on that point. On the other hand, maybe they would if they didn't want to get some kind of bad ruling on the constitutional or severability issue. So that's what I think is going to happen on that case. Um, and I also think, by the way, that this one's going to come out really late. Last thing is that if they strike down the Affordable Care Act, they will the 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 decision will not go into effect immediately. So it's not like everything is going to vanish immediately. There are contracts. There, the, the Supreme Court has done this before. Um, so it's not like it will be overnight. Although it will be quite a shock to the system because the Affordable Care Act has all kinds of things in it that have nothing to do with individual health insurance changes to the Indian Health Service and the Black Lung Fund, things like that. Okay, Rutledge versus PICMA, 
um, I don't have a lot to say about this one, just wanted you to know that it's out there, which is there are a lot of state laws that are seeking to regulate behavior by the pharmacy benefit managers. Um, and the PBMs, the pharmacy benefit managers, are pushing back and employers are pushing back because if the states win, if the states can do all this regulation, it's going to raise the cost of drugs considerably. So nobody is in love with the pharmacy benefit managers, but right now they're helping to keep the costs down. It's unclear, the law is really hard on this one. I've read all the cases and there's just no obvious answer. Um, but the bottom line here is, if the states win, the costs will go up. The state, they will, they will also have a lot better protections for pharmacies in their states. That's why they're doing this, because the PBMs have so much power that they often pay pharmacies less than the wholesale price, less than their purchase price of the drug. So we'll have to wait on this one. I think this case, we'll, we'll see an opinion on this case earlier than the one on the Affordable Care Act case, which I think will probably go down to the wire. So that, those are my thoughts on the cases, and I think we have a minute or two Great. for questions. Yes, please feel free to use the um, chat feature or the Q&A feature to submit any questions you may have. I'm not seeing any currently, but um, please do feel free to submit them even after the program and we'll do our best to, to follow up. Uh, for anyone who is participating for CLE credit, the code is healthcare2020. And we really appreciate you joining us for today's discussion. As I noted at the top of the hour, um, this is a continuing series, and there'll be additional ones the week of November 30th after Thanksgiving. And with that, I want to wish everybody a happy and safe Thanksgiving next week.